And we can only learn that from you, Kyle. So thank you as always for putting these thorough market reports together for the show. You know, from what I'm hearing also, it seems to be that Overstock really is bringing momentum to the T0 platform, which in turn, of course, correlates to the T0 token, something, you know, you've been saying on the show for months and logically because its success is tied to T0 trading volume. But given that they aren't the only tokens on the market, and since we talk on the show a lot about these different prices and valuations, I think it's time we tell our listeners how to read beyond the token trading data. You know, price discovery is crucial for investors and they must use any financial metrics they can in order to determine an asset's value. So today, maybe we figured it would be a great idea to break down a particularly relevant metric for valuing funds, the NAV value, right? So Kyle, why don't we pretend our listeners here have no clue about what this metric is or what it means to them? Maybe you can explain to them here, what is an NAV and how is it calculated? Yeah, definitely. This is an exciting topic. So a fund's NAV value or NAV is a standard way to calculate the book value of a fund. Now, NAV stands for net asset value, and that's calculated by adding up a firm's assets and then removing its liabilities. In a traditional fund, we'd usually stop the calculation there, but with a tokenized fund, it's then standard to divide the total NAV by the outstanding shares so that the NAV is represented on a per share basis. We can then use the total NAV as well as the NAV per share value and compare them with the market cap and share price values of a token so that on the secondary market to be able to determine a justification for whether the asset is undervalued, overvalued, or priced fairly. Okay, okay. So as an example, the Blockchain Capital Liquid Venture Fund, which I think is their third one, they, they raised 20% of its fund through the BCAP token in 2017. And since this token is backed by the investment fund, each BCAP token legally owns one share of the portfolio that this Liquid Venture Fund invests with. So the fund itself calculates its value by totaling the valuation of all the assets in the portfolio, which consists, by the way, of equity and startups like Kraken, Ripple, Circle, Coinbase, which may give them a liquidity event very soon, Securitize, and many others. And so they all have a small crypto, by the way, portfolio from 2017 as well. So in theory, as the valuations of these companies in that portfolio increases, so does the fund's net assets, and therefore, so does the NAV, right? So in BCAP's case, the firm announced a Q2 NAV of $4.47, up 25% from Q1, signaling that companies in their portfolio have been successful, whether they register that through higher valuation financing rounds or through acquisitions and things like that. So the NAV represents the net assets of a fund, including equities, crypto, and cash on hand. Right, but the NAV is really about as far as you can go for calculating a private fund's assets. It can be used to represent one of my favorite metrics for price discovery known as book value, which strives to value any asset, private or public, by first calculating the underlying value of what they own. By stripping out the marketing, hype, and the future projections, we try to essentially even the playing field by just looking at the present value of the assets it owns right now. The goal here is to try to determine what you could sell the whole thing for at this very moment in the event of a liquidation where you kind of need to fire sale it for just what the value is right now. By determining this number, we essentially create a price floor for the asset, which what we can then use to determine what the current price is and, and where it stands. Popularized by legendary investors like Ben Graham or Warren Buffett, as long as we're confident in our book value calculation, it becomes very easy to determine if a company's undervalued, at which time Buffett would jump in to capitalize. In this way, you can make a strong argument that the NAV represents the book value of a fund. Without having access to detailed information about the individual portfolio companies, we do have to assume that each current valuation is from the open market and is a fair market valuation for each firm. From there, we can conclude that the NAV does in fact represent the book value of the firm, which in this case suggests that BCAP's price floor is $4.47, as disclosed by the firm last week. With traditional venture firms, we cannot compare this NAV to the open market, like Buffett could with traditional equities. But via the secondary market dynamics of security tokens, we are afforded this luxury. BCAP tokens were last traded on Open Finance Network on July 12th, just a couple days ago, at $1.83, $1.83. 
Based on our previous logic, we'd conclude that BCAP is currently trading below book value because it's trading at $1.83 when we've calculated that the minimum it should be trading for would be $4.47 based on its underlying assets. From a book value perspective, it does seem to be undervalued. If we look at another fund like Spice VC, we can also see its NAV and its secondary trading pricing. So according to its website, the NAV is $1.32 compared to the share price on OFN of $0.96. Cents. Again, we could reasonably conclude that Spice is undervalued from a book value perspective. Finally, consider Protos Asset Management, which is another crypto hedge fund that does have its token trading on open finance. Their NAV is $0.29, cents, which is exactly equivalent to its trading price on OFN. In this instance, we could reasonably conclude that Protos Asset Management shares are fairly valued compared to its book value. Got it, got it. So by, you know, by comparing the growth rate, essentially, of a fund's NAV on a yearly basis, you could cal calculate the needed quarterly return each month and compare it to the current growth rate. You could even apply that quarterly return on a five, seven, or even 10-year basis, right? So depending on your risk tolerance, to the initial fundraise size to calculate the expected NAV value each quarter using that as a guide to determine an assets trend. So when doing any of these calculations, it is important to remember, especially if you're talking about early stage inve investments, especially with VC funds, much of the value accrues at a later stage of the fund. So it is not uncommon that five years into an investment, an investor may not see much traction or growth. It's not necessarily a, a good direct line, but then you know it's more of a, a hockey stick growth, realizing amazing returns in the later life cycle of a business or a fund. This makes investing in funds much, much more of a different mindset when you compare to the equity strategies that Kyle is referring to from Buffett and Graham. This isn't the only metric though used for determining the, the true value of a fund, right? So aside from considering its net asset value there and measuring the difference in that and its market cap, another perspective is to view a fund's uh, value from a return perspective, so the ROI. Venture capital funds pitch varying target returns to investors. These targets typically include three times net of fees at maturity or an average of 15% IRR over the life of the fund. So IRR stands for internal rate of return and basically describes what annual growth you could expect on your initial investment. Investors use these targets and compare it to various growth rates and metrics that they measure to to determine additional theories around the current valuation of a venture portfolio and whether it is properly valued or you know, at a discount or, or is it a strong sell. So based on our book value calculations, we can then make our own conclusions on the price of an asset and its future performance. Again, you can also use that with the IRR calculation. We also have to acknowledge the flaws in our own calculations while being mindful of price factors we haven't considered. Any of these calculations, we are, you have to recognize that we're blind to some things that may affect the price. When considering our own book value calculation, there could be other factors such as overly inflated equity valuations or misrepresentations of a portfolio company's assets that when combined with future factors such as a reduced investor interest level, economic cooldowns, corporate tax changes, or other things that could affect the future valuations and it would change the company's value and book value to the portfolio, resulting in a lower NAV than what was reported. Additionally, remember that there are many factors that contribute to an asset's price and book value is not the only thing to consider, as you mentioned, Hurley. Tech issues surrounding the issuance of tokens at scale, regulatory complaints, liquidity concerns, and public opinion around security tokens are just a few factors that will affect the price of an asset and its viability as a long-term investment. And some of that can explain why tokens may be trading at a discount inherently over what the traditional book value is, right? If you have risks associated with it being a security token, then those risks would need to be applied to the NAV. That would be considered a liability. You would do assets minus the new liabilities to calculate your new NAV. But you can consider shares of Overstock's digital, uh, Overstock's digital shares, excuse me, on T0, which are literally the exact same shares as the ones traded on NASDAQ, but they're currently trading at a 35% discount. If we could exchange these shares as a one-to-one -one swap somewhere, this would be considered an arbitrage opportunity where one could buy shares of OSTKO, the digital shares on T0, and then trade them in for NASDAQ shares of OSTK and then sell the OSTK at a 35% premium risk-free. 
And that's exactly why they actually don't let you do this if you were wondering. If you could, immediately all of the security tokens would be purchased and converted, leaving none on T0 and no interest to convert them the other way around, considering you'd actually have to pay for the transfer in addition to, the, to getting less liquidity and more risk. So we can conclude from that that the security token aspect definitely has an impact on the price here, whether you know it's through liquidity or other risks associated with security tokens. In this case, it would be a 35% liquidity premium. However, this mindset may quickly shift in the future. We believe it will. Security tokens allow for global investment, right? So as adoption continues around the world, more and more investors may prefer this investment vehicle as a uniform option across all of their assets, irrespective of industry or just jurisdiction. Everything will be tokenized, right? So in this case, launching a security token opens up capital markets from investors all around the world, not just your home country. And as a result could create more liquidity than say what the NASDAQ could, eventually creating a liquidity premium on NASDAQ traded paper shares that represent exactly the same investor rights as their digital, digitally shared you know, T0 counterpart. While it is not the case today, of course, for publicly, you know, public equity markets, uh, and especially not for a while, we certainly think that this will be the case when compared to fully liquid markets like venture capital funds. And this may quickly become the preferred method with investors willing to pay more just for the early liquidation opportunities alone. Great point, Herwig. I could totally see an investor in an illiquid asset class offering to pay a few percent more for the future liquidity options that aren't afforded to analog asset investors. Consider it no different than a convertible bond offered by a corporation or insurance purchased by an asset owner. You're buying an additional right or additional protection for your asset and therefore have to pay a premium for that additional protection. Hopefully, this helped you understand what a NAV value is and what their role is in determining the price discovery and evaluating the prices on the secondary market. If you enjoy and have feedback or want to recommend a future topic, as we said, please reach out to us via Twitter or LinkedIn. And you can also leave a comment on our YouTube channel or participate in the discussion on stlmarket.com news. Additionally, we do post the main topic of each podcast as its own separate video on YouTube, allowing you to quickly catch up on just the main topic we discuss each week. All 50 plus episodes are now posted in both their long and short format. So feel free to watch any of the other main topics we've covered that you may have missed or share specific topics with other interested friends, colleagues, or investors that you may have in your network. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next week. Thank you for listening. Hope to catch you.